I want to stay and fight. But won't we lose the fight to the men and be forced to forgive them anyway? I want to stay and fight too. No one's surprised that you do. All you do is fight. Is this really how we are to decide the fates of all the women in this colony? And just another vote where we put an X next to our position? I thought we were here to do more than that. You mean talk more about forgiving the men and doing nothing? Everything else is insane. But none of you will listen to reason. Well, why are you here with us? Why are you still here with us if that is what you believe? Just leave with the rest of the do-nothing women. She is my daughter, and I want her here with us. Is forgiveness that's forced upon us true forgiveness? Keep nonsense like that to yourself, please. Hello and welcome to Tonebender's Sound Design Podcast, where we talk with the sonic artists behind our favorite films, games, and series. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I'm sitting in studio on location at Formosa's Toronto facility to talk about the powerful new film from director Sarah Pauly, Women Talking. The film chronicles the fallout of a discovery of horrific proportions in a religious colony and the process taken to decide what is to be done in reaction to this atrocity. The majority of the film is an ongoing conversation all taking place in a single barn's loft space, leading viewers to think that the sound work would have to be fairly straightforward. But simplicity can also mean there's nowhere to hide any potential problems, and suddenly any issues can become incredibly complex. To tell us more about the challenges this film presented, we are joined by the film's co-sound supervisors, David McCallum and Jane Tattersall. Both are returning Tonebenders guests, and it's great to see you both again. Welcome to Tonebenders. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much. Awesome. We also have Women Talking's re-recording mixer, Joe Morrow, who handled mostly the sound effects on this mix, but we'll get into everything that you handled. Welcome, Joe. It's great to meet you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm always really impressed with your thoughtful and insightful questions on tone bender, so I can't wait to hear what you have in store for us. Don't try and soften me up. I got the hard <laughs> questions for you, okay? Watch out for Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about the dialogue in Women Talking first. The film is a very dialogue-heavy production. There might never have been a more aptly named film than women talking. David told me that Sarah Pauly, the film's director, on day one set the bar saying, in this film, every line matters, every word has meaning, and every syllable has weight. The dialogue has to be the best it can be. So let's start with you, David, because I believe you're in the driver's seat on dialogue editorial. As I mentioned in the intro, to the viewer, this film appears to be shot in a hayloft of a barn in a calm, serene, rural setting. So uh, how complicated can that be, David? Yeah, that's what I thought when I saw it, too. (laughs) It was pretty complicated. I I, I think it's safe to say that it's the most challenging edit and the most challenging film that I've encountered. You know, there's there was just a lot of material, and the locations where the where the film was shot wasn't a studio. So the types of problems that we might not normally get in a film like this: interference, noise interference, air conditioning, highway electrical buzzes and different things because the space just wasn't acoustically treated or designed for recording sound. It was shot at the Enercare Center, um, one of the convention buildings at the Enercare Center. So for those that aren't from Toronto listening, the Enercare Center is is downtown in the city near a major highway. Yeah, it's right beside a major highway. And this film does not take place near a major highway. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so if it's not a sound-treated space, that highway is obviously a major issue. Yeah, I mean, they they did as much as they could. So there's no slighting the efforts of the production or the crew, but the location was the location. The highway wasn't our biggest obstacle because you didn't actually hear moving traffic. But at basically what I worked out with the sound recordist, Herwig Geyer, was that at rush hour or at busier times of the day, there was a weight to the sound that was higher. So the noise floor at the bottom end in particular was raised. And when you add to that, uh, they shot the movie in August. So to turn off the air conditioner would just have been torture for the actors. So it wasn't possible to ask for that. And they had a lot of lights to manage the shooting. So when you're starting with that, as your kind of baseline, it invades everything that you have to do. Every outtake, every change from angle to angle, 
shifts in sound. So the the transitions and the general work of looking for alternative takes to fix problems, you're just layering more and more. You have to continuously searching for more and more noise. So we were pretty collaborative, Joe and myself and Lou Solikovsky, in assessing how we would attack basically different scenes because even though it's all one location, the scenes all sounded quite different at different times of the day. And we would sort of strategize how to tackle the noise in any given scene. The actors were also really varied in how much volume they would use. So there were times when the actors were just speaking well above any noise problems and it wasn't difficult to control it. But then other times it would get very, very gentle and very quiet and all of a sudden the noise is a much bigger part of what we were experiencing as we were getting started. So there was a lot of collaboration to kind of figure out how are we going to manage this. Sarah, none of us were open to ADRing the movie to solve this problem. That just wasn't even considered. There's way too much dialogue in the film to think that this is a problem that we would put back onto the actors. For sure. Well, obviously, the dialogue is a major component of the film. And I, I think if you are working in audio post and you hear that there's problematic dialogue, you think, well, great. We can just get the composer to write wall-to-wall -wall music. We can hide all the problems in that. Joe, is that what happened? That is not what happened. <laughs> uh, as beautiful as the score is in this film, it, it's used very sparingly and to like a very in a very effective way, but there's not a ton of it, right? So we had, uh, yeah, our work cut out for us, Jane and I, with the ambiences as well as yeah, getting the dialogue cleaned up and everything like that. So, Jane, how did you tackle the ambiences? We're going to focus right now kind of on the main location, the, the barn loft. Obviously, it was shot in a studio, but to the viewer in the end, it's a barn in the middle of a serene field. There were slats in the walls of the barn, so you do have the option to bring in some of the outside world and also kind of give the barn some life as well. What, what were your uh, first thoughts when you saw this? Uh, I was extremely excited to see a barn as a location. And the reason for that is I have access to a barn, like 24-hour, all-year-round access to a barn, because we have a, a place in the country which is a farm. So I have started recording in that barn. I actually started years ago recording in the barn because it's just such a fascinating acoustical environment. It's quite open with the slats between all the boards. Like a plane goes by or geese fly overhead or pigeon flutters around, like you hear absolutely everything. So it's interior, which means you're getting the, the bounce of the sound, but you're also hearing a lot of bleed. So to have the, that setting, which is so spectacularly beautiful, I thought, I've great, I've got tons of source material for this. And how did you start building it? Did you start with the interior or the exteriors? Um, I started with the interiors because it like the, a barn moves when it's because of the way it's constructed. So it creaks and it, it, and it creaks severely when it's very windy. If it's raining, you get, you hear all the rain on the roof and on the sides. Um, so I, yeah, I, I started with the interior collecting ambiences from that. And then I realized that I probably needed to have like some additional sources, especially because I heard David talking about all the challenges he was about to experience with the dialogue. So I I went to a several other barns and recorded their spaces, only to find they're actually a little bit different. If they're smaller, they're different, or depending on what material that's in the barn. One of them had a steel roof, and that steel roof would expand and contract with the temperature outside. And so it made fantastic creaking sounds that I don't know how you could ever replicate that. Well, I'm sure Foley could replicate it. It's because it's they're so very creative. But, um, but so I was able to get those sounds as well. And then I, it, because the film was so much set in the barn, I needed to have a lot of variation. So it wasn't just cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. And I wanted to approach it in a way that I would have fun with, as opposed to it being just another show to put some sound in. And how did you have fun with it? Sarah had shot footage of children playing in the fields or like just playing like running around playing children's games and I don't know if it, if it was the sound that came from that or if it was a separate wild track for kids playing but it was really long and it was extremely fantastic to have access to that because 
There are times when you want to hear children playing in the distance while you're in the barn. There are times we actually see them, but sometimes you just want to hear a little sprinkle of them. And it's it's not that easy to get very natural sounding, well recorded kids playing. And so to have that as you know, just one of the little ingredients that's part of the whole soundscape was really a, a treasure. This is the kind of film I like to do anyway. It's it's subtle, but the sound is I, I know is going to have a place in it. The director's going to notice, even if the audience doesn't really notice. And I could put in the amount of detail that like I like to put in. It also takes place over a stretch of time so that I was able to have a purpose, which was show the passage of time, don't be overt about it, but the first scene in the barn, which takes place early in the morning, would not sound the same as it does later, which is later at night, and then dawn, and then once again back in early in the morning. Jane, you went to set to record. You went to the the exterior location as well, didn't you? Yeah, I, I asked if I could go to the location. The location, which was not where they shot most of the interior footage, was was actually on a country setting. It's It, too, was close to a highway, but it had... Um, it was in July, and July in Ontario means a lot of crickets. So I was able to record masses of crickets and from different locations. But I also had access to all the things that we see outside in the film. So the fields of soya beans, the pump that they pump water with, and the stables that the horses are sometimes in, and the, the wash house where the kids are playing. So I could record all those things. And even though the crew was there, and it was a pretty big crew, the space was so vast, I could go and record footsteps in a kitchen, which was a long way away from the crew making their noise. So you mentioned, uh, well, David mentioned that it was shot in Toronto. You mentioned that the exteriors were in uh, rural Ontario. There's an issue that when you're watching the film, you might not even think about in that I'm not, I don't think it explicitly says in the film where it's supposed to take place, but there, the actors in the film are all from around the world. There's Irish, British, uh, American, but you don't hear any of those accents. It's kind of a generic North American accent, I'd say. Were the actors able to hold those accents the whole time, David? They did quite well. Uh, the, the, they were striving for a generic, nondescript place. So the movie's not set in Canada. It's not set in America. It's not really set anywhere. So we're not supposed to really think about where these people are from. You know, they, they all worked very hard at kind of finding a common accent together. And I think they did a great job f from the source material. When I first saw the film, I thought, oh, the accents are excellent. There was only a couple of things that caught my ear that I felt like, well, maybe we should tweak this. And it's because I have a bit of a sensitivity to Irish. So there were a few lines from Jesse Buckley's. And I thought, oh, she sounds a little bit Irish there, but not a lot. I didn't think of it as a very big deal. But when we sat down to spot for Sarah, she had an extensive list of things that she was concerned about for accent. And I remembered um, this from when we worked together on Alias Grace. She's extremely tuned towards accents and she finds it distracting if she can hear something and she really didn't want anyone to question that so as we started going through the movie uh, the list of things that she wanted us to repair or look to repair if we could was extensive uh, and then it, it got to the point that it was so much that we felt we needed some outside guidance so we engaged with a dialect coach who was the same woman we used on alias grace to review the movie for us and give us her input. And so between Sarah's notes and Brett's notes, I had a fairly extensive list of things that she wanted us to look to improve. Where And it, it was focused primarily on uh, Jesse Buckley and Claire Foy. Uh, there were some issues with Frances McDormand sounding a little too New Yorkish for Sarah. So she wanted me to look at that as well. And we thought we might need to ADR with her, but in fact, we didn't. I just, I was able to actually uh, address that with um, alternate takes and just looking at basically looking through her performances overall and building something that just had a softer accent. And Sarah was very happy with that. But we did we spent a lot of time reviewing and assessing the accents and then we attempted to repair them with production sound first and then what was left over from our list went to ADR. But it wasn't, we never actually attempted to replace entire lines. It was very surgical and literally improving 
syllables where the actors would slip and they would lose their their accent. So it's not that they didn't have it, it's just in the emotion of the drama and in the middle of their performance, they would, you know, they would deviate. And often Sarah let these things happen without cuts. So they weren't able to edit around it because the actors were just given the camera. So we, we spent, there was a lot of work going through finessing the accents first alone and then with the actors. And it, this was one of the things that made this so time consuming was the amount of footage. There were, like I like to point out the big speech that they're using with Claire Foy for her, all of her Oscar demonstrations. There's quite a few edits in that. And, and Sarah is not exaggerating when she said they shot it 120 times. <laughs> and they, the, one of the things Herwig did for us, which was m magnificent, was he had them mic'd regardless of where the camera was. So we were very consistent in what we could go back to. And he didn't have 14 booms, but everyone had a radio on and he had multiple booms. So it was very likely that I could track, but it didn't take an enormous amount of time to listen through all of these takes to try to find performance matches that also address the accent note. And then we did record with the actors in ADR. It was a really interesting session because again, the actors knew we were trying to be surgical. So they were working very, very hard to fix their accents while not replacing the entire line of ADR. And the, our engineers, they, they were both in the UK. We were with Nick Cray at KR Audio or Cray Audio and Nick Roberts at uh, Delane Lee. And they were both really good at identifying the syllables that we were calling. It was myself, Sarah, and Brett, the accent coach, identifying takes we thought would work. And they would just grab these little syllables and match them in uh, with a bit of EQ and a bit of reverb so we could see if we were able to pull off what we were, uh, what we were striving for. Was the ADR session from an actor's point of view like a normal ADR section and you were just pulling out things or were you having them just say syllables? No, we would have them say the whole lines okay. with the objective of fixing the syllables. So they knew what to concentrate on in terms of what we were trying to fix. But they also knew we weren't trying to replace the whole line of ADR. So there, there would be times when they would kind of be ramping themselves essentially through the lines as they were working on it to just try to kind of both match the energy, match the pitch, and get the correction down. Um, and then when we got one that we thought, oh, that's going to match, it was like, well, the, we didn't fix the accent on that one. Darn. It's like, okay, now we've got the accent fixed. I don't, we don't know if it's going to slot in. And this is where Nick and Nick would sort of step in to kind of find the fixes. So from their perspective, they were recording the same, but we all knew what the goal was. Um, and it was to try to fix these problems rather than redo their performances in ADR. So, Joe, uh, David earlier mentioned that when you were when he was doing the dialogue cleanups, he was brought you in early. To were you, how, what was the collaboration between mixer and editorial for the dialogue cleanup early on? David often sends us scenes early in the process to just check out and and see like, hey, I've done my pass on this. Can you or Lou take a look at this and and see what you guys can do with it on top of what I've done? See if we have a different perspective from how he's cleaned out the noise to what we've we can do. And so we'll take little sections of the film, mess around with it, send it back to him. He might. Uh, take what we've done and be like, oh, that's much better than what I came up with. Or he might say, you know what, what I did is going to work fine. And yeah, and then once we start pre-mixing, there's a ton of collaboration between David and us as we're pre-mixing and sending stuff back and forth. You were moving back and forth a bit. Why was that happening? We had a bit of a tricky thing happen right at, I guess it was right at the end of our pre-mix time and before the final mix where we had a bit of a run-in with COVID, so both our picture editor and our lead mixer, Lou, got COVID. And I think due to everyone's schedule, we really needed to forge ahead and not delay anything. And, and so 
In addition to doing the effects pre-mixing, I, I finished some of the dialogue pre-mixing, did a couple reels, and then started the first few days of the mix on my own, handling both sides of the board until Lou was feeling better and was out of the quarantine sort of process. And uh, thankfully I had David and Sarah with me in the room. We sort of got through, I don't know, a reel and a half or something, uh, just f trying to get as far as we could with just one person manning uh, all of the faders. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was um, w when when Lou then joined us, we didn't pick up from where we were. We actually jumped back to the beginning, so as, as if this was now our first day. And it actually worked so successfully because we it felt like we were starting t our mix, but the reel was already mixed. <laughs> and so it meant that we created real momentum right off the top. And I, I've come away from that thinking, well, that's a model. Like that's a good way to work, to put yourself in a position where you're doing advanced work and you're doing really elaborate advanced work, but you know you're going to go backwards so that you keep a little bit of the pressure off and you're not trying to complete something and then start again. It was hectic and stressful when we were navigating it but once we were through it, it felt like, well, that model, that worked well uh, for us. Yeah, and nice to have, like, just different perspectives on the mix. Like, I, I got to do the first reel of it and a half on my own. And then Lee would come in and be like, oh, yeah, I like what you did here. But here, I think I can, you know, tinker with this a little bit. And uh, I think it just made the movie sound better, having, you know, another pass with another set of ears, another set of skills and techniques and everything. So if I'm correct, David, you were saying that as the day shooting days progressed, the background sounds would change. So you couldn't just kind of pick a setting and apply it to everything, right? No. I mean, I would say we went clip by clip for the most part in trying to manage the noise. As it got later in the night, you know, or into the evening, so the middle reels of the movie, I, I would say that we had more coverage because all of a sudden there was a kind of a bit of a denser background, but we wanted perfect dialogue before the sound effects showed up. I really feel like sound effects benefit from not having to do the job of hiding dialogue issues. So we set out to have perfect dialogue, as Sarah had asked. We didn't achieve perfect. I don't think it exists, but our goal was to get it as clean as possible so that when the sound effects came in, Joe was Joe and Jane were doing creative work, not, oh, we need to hide something here. And, I, you know, I, f I feel pretty comfortable about that. When I hear the movie now, and I've seen it quite a few times in the finished mix, there's nothing that I hear that I think, oh, I want to go back on that. There are some things that I don't think are amazing, but I still think we made the best choices. Like, well, we got the best performance there. So it's not the best fidelity option that we maybe had. But it, it, there's no time when I look at it and think, oh, I wish we'd done something else. And there's one scene in the movie where we we ended up with our hybrid of, we shot the entire scene in ADR, and um, but I edited the dialogue completely as well and then sat and did a kind of A-B of what I thought was best. It's the scene between Rooney Mara and Ben Wishaw on the roof. And, um, you know, we had, the challenge, you know, they shot that at night. There's only radio microphones because uh, the camera was below them or behind them. There's just no boom. And it didn't sound great. It wasn't unusable, but it wasn't good. And so I asked the actors to do it again. I was nervous about it, but they were amazing, like absolutely magnificent in recording the scene without complaint at all. And Sarah was just wonderful watching her direct them through it. We were all fully committed to, we are going to use this ADR. And when I got it and edited it all, it was amazing, but I still felt like, okay, now we have to test the ADR against the production sound. And I think I brought Joe and Lou in when I was doing that work to kind of like, which ones, what do you think? And I would play them uh, uh, the weave that I'd built and we just kept pushing it. And we changed it again, even right on the last day of the mix, we made a couple of swap changes. But I remember sending a message to Sarah after watching the film at TIFF, and I said, you know, I can't remember. I watched the movie now, and I can't remember which in that scene is production and which is ADR. And she's, she texted back, because I, I, don't, I don't remember either. 
which is kind of perfect. That's yeah, that's exactly. the goal of like I can't tell which we used. Um, so I'm very very proud of that scene because the the performances are tender and hard to redo. But man, when you get actors of that quality, you can really do anything in ADR. Wow, I I, I didn't know about the where the film was shot. I to I, I am a, a naive individual who believes in movie magic. So I assumed it was shot in a barn. So when I uh, heard that it was shot in a, a convention center, I, I didn't feel any of that while watching the movie. It, it felt like all the dialogue was placed in the barn perfectly. So it, it worked. Whatever you did, it was magic. When I get back Lou and Joe's work, I am uh, mesmerized by how skilled they are at managing noise and preserving voice. I feel like I can get rid of noise, but I damage voice. And I, my, my limitation is always I stop myself when I feel like I'm, I've, I'm damaging the voice too much. And when I get their work returned to me, there are times when not only is the noise gone, but the voice sounds so much better and so much richer. It's like, how do they do it? What are their skills that I don't have? Um, and I, so I feel the same way that that problem, which was a big one for us at the beginning, is not a problem at all. And I think if anyone watched the movie now, I hope they would say, what are these guys talking about? It sounds <laughs> fine. Uh, I think that might be the case. Something I want to talk about, uh, we'll get away from dialogue for a moment. Jane, do you want to talk about, uh, in the film, at points, we go kind of back a little bit in time to memories do you want to talk about the sound design of how you differentiated those from present tense? Yeah, that was actually in the script. Uh, Sarah had written those flashbacks as having a sound that was like harsh, like harsh machine-like sounds, which would be like really hard to listen to and aggravating. And she, anyway, she asked me to come up with some sounds for that. Or she asked, she put it in the script and then asked for temp sounds for that. So I took... Uh, I took a whole lot of like grinding sounds and vocalizations. I, I myself and another um, person, we did some like <sighs> kind of sounds into a mic, and I layered them and pitched them down. So all of it sounded like horrible things happening to a human and metallic industry. And um, I played them for Joe, and Joe said. I don't think it sounds harsh enough. <laughs> <laughs> did I say that? You did. That. <laughs> like, okay, Joe, I'm not sure what else to do. <laughs> anyway, I gave them to the picture department and so they could incorporate it into their temp tracks. And then um, they just never appeared. So I asked, like, like what happened? Um, you know, feeling like, oh, my God, like, I should do this again. And, you know, you always want to please them. Um and was told that, in fact, uh, I should come and listen to the score that had been created because they were really happy with what it was. And I heard what Hilder had done, and it was the most extraordinary sound, definitely music, and it worked with the rest of the score, but it was it conveyed exactly what the sound design was supposed to, you know, the sound effects sound design was supposed to convey. And, like, I had, like, like, Absolutely. There's no way that I could do anything better than that. It was really cool to listen to that because often when you work in sound effects, you kind of think like score just like takes the opportunity away and it could work with both of them. But in this case, she just nailed it. That's awesome. Uh, there's a scene in the film where I guess a census taker is the, a pickup truck comes through their colony uh, with loudspeakers on top. And it's playing a song by the monkeys. And it drives by each house individually. And we see the perspective from inside the house. And your first instinct, I would think, would be to have the music drop down and come back up and drop back down. But that takes away the, the feel, the, the push of the music. So I feel like the way you tackled that, uh, I could be completely wrong, but what I got out of it was instead of doing massive volume rides, you rode the effects that you put onto the music. 
Yeah, so that was Lou mixing the both the uh, the loudspeaker voice and the music through there. But yeah, we we did a lot of perspective shifts. Like all the perspective shifts are in there, but we didn't want to lose the energy of the music blaring because it's such a foreign thing in this film to have a, a pop song playing in the middle of this. You, you know, yeah, an movie. alien just showed up yeah, in the film, and, basically, and yeah. so. Yeah, so I th- uh, yeah, I mean Lou played with like the the reverb and the slap and the uh you know the distortion on the the treatment of both the voice and the music and it was really important to Sarah that we get that this is 2010, it's a census being taken, like it, it's I think the only part in the movie where you're placed in a in a time and so the loudspeaker's blaring, and you, yeah, you hear it probably more than you should in a lot of these perspectives, um, but you still get the idea that, oh, now it's over there and a little bit more down the road. Now it's going by the window. Now it's panning behind us and coming back around. So, yeah, that's sort of how we tackled it. Well, there was it's interesting, though, because I think the first time we mixed that scene, we, it was pretty much as you'd described it. it was, we were very predictable or traditional about it. So it started quiet, comes in, passes by. And we watched it, watched the whole scene. It's a couple of minutes long. And we all kind of looked at each other and was just like, nope, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the energy fall off or the energy lift just wasn't there. It, it just felt too mechanical in a way. And so we talked about it for a little while. And then Lou and Joe said, okay, give us a bit of space because uh, Joe obviously had to m- match what Lou was doing in terms of the car. So if they were going to move it around and do space, both sides of the board had to had to do that. So the rest of us just kind of left and they, they said, okay, we'll take another stab at it. And basically went the other direction. It's like, let's start with it high and see what we can do. How high can we keep this music and how do we keep the energy going? Which is, I think, the way it came to us, like out of the avid, the the picture editor Chris had kind of designed it to be bold, and so we all we left, came back about half an hour later, and they played us the second version, which Lou and Joe crafted on their own, and it was like we were all like, oh yeah, that's fun. <laughs> so they they still spent another like hour or two on it, finessing it, but we were all pretty excited at it. It's like, yeah, the rules kind of go out the window with respect to perspective, but we wanted it to be bold and a bit crazy. And I think it kind of worked. Yeah. Jane, let's talk a bit about the idea of being a sound supervisor on a film like this. How long was your editorial process? Talk us through kind of your first day till your last day. So my sound supervisor role was really in the making of the track. I worked with wonderful sound editor, Alex Bullock, and uh, I did the first couple of reels and sent them to him so that he would have an idea of like what I was trying to go for. And one of the things we had to go for was the comment that Sarah had made, which is this: the book that the film is based on is set in Bolivia, but she didn't want it to be a film set in Bolivia. She wanted it to be set in no specific place. So we couldn't choose specific Ontario birds where anyone in one Ontario say, oh yeah, that sounds like where I've been before. Um, so she had suggested we should try birds from all up and down North and South America. So that was our first attempt at it, birds and insects, only to find that we thought like, this sounds really weird. Like we're in the tropics and it's obvious that we're not in the tropics. So, so that was part of the discovery that we made during the sound editorial part of it. So yeah, I I was, as the sound supervisor, it was a bit of a different role to take on this one. But I've worked with David McCallum for many years now, and he's he knows what I, what I'm trying to do. He knows he knows what my taste would be. Um, I've worked with Joe for many years. He's handled my tracks for years and years and years. So I was not concerned about like not having my voice in there and not having my hammer in there to direct things because, you know, this is a team that like we work so wonderfully well together and we're so trusting and confident and like, I don't mind taking direction. I don't mind giving direction. It's just, it all feels very natural. So when you, you mentioned you did the first couple reels and then handed it over to Alex, were there any kind of rules that you had him to follow? Did you have any kind of uh, sounds that matched characters or... 
were you just building the environment? It was building the environment and building the sense of time. Um, and so I did that, and then I did the last reel, and then he handed it back to me, everything he'd done, so that I could go through it all. And and get, the way it works, certainly with me, perhaps with all other sound effects editor, is as time goes by, you get more ideas, and somehow you're sleeping on on sleeping it within your brain and you come up with things that you want to add so you have to go back to reels so by the time I'd gone through two reels and then the last reel and then I got Alex's material back like I had more ideas and more thoughts for what we could put in and uh, like I, I let him know everything that I was doing just because you know we did we did it together um, but he didn't have a problem with any of these things so awesome so uh the, another, in addition to the music of the monkeys, there's the main characters sing in the film. And the last time they sing, I believe, our perspective on it changes a lot. We're in the barn with them, we're far away from the barn, and we're experiencing the singing as the people waking up in the community hear them singing and start coming towards them. How much of that was production, ADR? Do you want to talk about mixing that, Joe? Or Yeah, I mean, again, Lou, Lou mixed that, but... Uh... It's a lot of production, but there's a bunch of loop group tracks in there as well, right, David? Well, it's actually a, it's a, it's a hybrid of production sound, a wild track that they did on set. So it starts in production, goes to a wild track, and ends in production. The wild track was shot, obviously, right in, in the location, but they restructured the wild track for recording. So we got a quite nice microphone uh, set up for that including a mid-side of it. Um, we then, I ex then did get the actors, the individual actors, to record um, their parts again because the way that the singing begins, there's a rhythm to... It's, it's sort of like a handoff as they're reaching and, and taking each other's hands. Sarah and wanted us to feel each woman sort of adding themselves to it. And we didn't have that in production. So I, I basically got all of the actors to record their intros until we reached the point where they're all singing again and layered it uh, one step at a time. And then we did bring in, we did have a, a loop group of just women and we recorded two harmonies of it to layer in to help with the kind of just adding a bit of additional weight and body. And, you know, we talked to Sarah about that theoretically because she wondered, well, shouldn't it just be the people that are in the barn? So we had a conversation about it, and I, I, like, I said something to her that just came out. Like, it wasn't an intentional thing. I just said, like, yeah, but I kind of think it's like all the women joining in, all the women in the colony joining in. And she looked at me as, like, this theoretical idea and she's like, yeah, they are. And so she was quite keen, then let's try this. So we did get them to, we, did, we got the loop groupers to sing it as well. And we made sure that everyone we cast had a good, you know, was, was a good singer. So it, those were the layers that kind of went to Lou and Joe to work with. And, you know, the, the, the wild track is, is the driver. Like the ADR gets us into it. The wild track is the driver. And it's probably like... 70 to 80 percent of what you're hearing overall but i think what you're also talking about is how expansive it's mixed like we hear it from quite a distance because we leave the barn and that is a little bit of a subjective cheat you know definitely the the objective there was to allow the people in the colony that hadn't participated in this conversation to be pulled towards it and to be unified in the in the reaction of of the decision that they were going to make or that they'd made, you know, it's like like a number of the moments in the film, the other singing moments too, where we kind of had the production sound and just sort of experimented with different ways of expanding it. And sometimes we would pull right back and not use anything we recorded, but generally the idea was to kind of like explore in recording what more these moments could be and see if that was an interesting addition to the film. Well, speaking of interesting parts of the film, I'm going to talk about the credit roll. Normally when the film fades to black, big music comes up and that takes us to the end. But I stayed to watch all the credits and uh, it goes to black. We have a little bit of silence. 
and then uh, I think it was wind first, and then the monkey song comes back. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll ride the monkey song out till the end. But then it cuts off before the song would normally end. And I think we go back to the winds maybe, and then there's rain. And then at the very end, I, there's children singing. Uh, does anyone want to talk about how that came about, wh- what the process was there? I think David's going to want to talk about this. <laughs> oh, okay. What have I stumbled into? <laughs> uh, the um, Hilder's score concludes with the climax of the movie, the end of the movie. And there was a desire to not go back to score. That essentially she had built a very structured, I don't know what the word would be. Um, there's a there's a, an arc to her music that concludes there. So to re- reprise something from the movie and the credit sequence didn't really work for Sarah. She's like, no, the music's over. So we're kind of done with, with the score. We didn't want to go and find another piece of music. Um, so she asked... Like, could we just have sound effects, essentially? Could could we play sound effects? And, and, and this was a decision, like, in the mix. Yeah, like this it came was up, late, like, at the late. beginning of the mix. We didn't have, it was like, we kept asking, what are we doing for the credits? We don't have the music for the credits. We don't have anything. And then Sarah was like, I don't think I want music. I think I want sound effects. So, uh, you know, we we talked about what that meant, you know, because... Again, it's a, it was a literal choice in the sense of like, well, where are we though? Like if we're going to play sound effects, where are the sound effects? And she said, well, I think it's at the new colony. I think where we're waking up to is where the women go. It's not where they've been, it's where they're going. So I kind of just, you know, it's like six and a half minutes long. And I set out with an idea of like, all right, let's just have a day at the new colony. Let's. What does a day at the new colony sound like? So I went through some of Jane's sound and I explored the kind of like the sounds of the atmospheres of the space and began with essentially morning, dawn. So the wind is like no, nothing is awake yet. All you're hearing is the wind. And then slowly we bring in birds. And and I, I, I built a kind of a, an entire soundscape that it actually had the singing children fairly early on in it that lasted the whole kind of credit sequence. But there was a kind of like, but maybe we want to bring the monkeys back. Maybe we want to bring the monkeys back. (laughs) So again, though, it's like you can't go right to the monkeys. It's only a two and a half minute song and you can't go right to the monkeys right at the end of Hilder's score. Like that doesn't, that didn't work at all. It'd be jarring, yeah. It was really jarring. So the idea came, well, why don't we put it at the actor's credits? Like let's, let's, or so let's get through the actor's credits and then when the scroll begins, we'll, we'll go to the monkeys. So we ended up with like about a minute of sound effects. So I kind of took what I had done as a, as a montage, a six minute sound effects montage and, and restructured it uh, so that there's an opening, then the monkeys come and then we get back to it. And it's, it is a kind of day, it, you know, it starts with gentle, there's rain and thunder and then calm. And then I was, I was like, the singing that you hear is actually Sarah's children. And the director's Sarah's yeah, children. Yeah, the director's oh, wow. Sarah's children. And it was a wild track that they'd recorded on set that I had found when listening to the source material. And I just thought that was it's kind of interesting and fun. And I had used it in this montage sequence and then decided, well, let's put it right at the very end of the movie. Let's let Let's give the end of this movie to Sarah's children. But... Trickily, there were only two of them singing. Sarah has three children, and the only two of them were participating. And literally on the last day of the mix, Sarah said, you know, it's it breaks my heart that my youngest isn't there. <laughs> and so I said, well, can't we bring her in? Couldn't we record? And, and she, she sort of looked at me. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so the, she, she emailed her husband or texted her husband, and they were going out of town that day, so... They they came to the studio a little bit earlier when we brought the youngest one, Amy, in, and we let her listen to what her uh, her siblings had done, and she sang along to it in her little like three year old voice. And we we recorded a few takes of it. It was unbelievably charming. And we layered, so the last thing we did was layer that third voice in so that it now sounds like three children singing uh, just one of the hymns from the movie. So that's how we, that's how that kind of all kind of came about. 
it's a cool choice because obviously the movie is dealing with extremely heavy issues. And then, you know, to, as you're leaving the theater to hear this kind of hopeful children singing kind of puts a nice bow on the end of it. I thought it was a really cool choice. Sarah's, I know she's not alone in it, but she's a director who really, really loves the sound process. And I think it's because she's she can comment on things as opposed to having to lead it all. And it, it's for her, it's like a sheer pleasure. And one of the things that I've noticed in her press about the movie as well is uh, comments about collaboration and how important collaboration is to her. And it's interesting to hear her speak about that because as a, a crew that's worked with her in the past, we're quite aware of how much she expects us to bring to the to the process our own ideas and our own thoughts. She doesn't ask us to do what she wants. She pr- creates a scenario where we do what we think is right or best and, and wants to receive those things from us. So to know that she was exploring the concept of collaboration while giving us this space to kind of be our best selves, uh, it was um, it's interesting to kind of have that perspective on it now too. That sounds awesome. That sounds really inspiring unto itself. Many projects we work on have guide tracks that are created during the, during the picture edit and try as we might to be creative beyond the bounds of the guide track. Sometimes the filmmakers like to go back to what they had heard and became familiar with. Tempitis. But because of the process of this, of how this film was made uh, during post-production, is yes, there was a, a guide track and it was a fairly fold out guide track, but it didn't have as much detail as some, some of them tend to. So it actually was, for me, much more freeing knowing that they hadn't totally immersed themselves in creating the guide track, which was exactly what they wanted to hear. So while we should replicate it to some extent, there is a lot more opportunity for us to just think about things that might go into it. I think we'd also be uh, remiss if we didn't comment on the Foley work that we received from Andy Malcolm and his facility footsteps up in Uxbridge, Ontario. Uh, they did an amazing job. I can still remember walking into Joe's premix on day one of Foley and thinking, okay, this Foley, we really need some good Foley here. And the first thing I heard were these big, loud, clumping boots across the barn and heavy bales of hay being tossed around. And I thought, oh, it's great. <laughs> we wanted it to be big and thick and messy. And uh, and I think it, you know, I, I thought what they brought to the table for us was exceptionally good. Yeah, Andy doesn't mess around. Him, him and his team are always delivering good stuff, that's for sure. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. Uh, I really enjoyed the film, and uh, I also really enjoyed coming down and actually interviewing you in person. Normally these interviews are done uh, digitally over computers or something, so it's awesome to be uh, face-to-face, although, Joe, I can't see you with this pop screen <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. I really hope that a lot of people find their way to see it because it's really worth seeing. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you, Tim. If you have a chance, please make sure you see Women Talking. It's well worth your time. I want to send a big thanks out to the folks at Formosa Toronto for inviting me into their facility to conduct this interview. Also a big thanks to Richard Callistan, who was kind enough to set up the room for the interview and engineer the recording. I threw him a couple curveballs and he was on point. Also, I need to send out a massive thanks to Robin Edgar for doing an excellent job cutting and mixing this episode. Robin is an audio engineer and sound designer focused on narrative podcasts and radio. She currently works at Pacific Content and on a handful of freelance projects as well. You can find her on Twitter at underscore Robin Edgar. That's Robin with a Y. Robin will be getting a free copy of the amazing sound effects library, Sonic Springs, donated by its creator, Katrina Amsler. Please keep an ear out on our podcast feed in the next few weeks as we have an excellent episode coming up on one of my favorite films in a long while, the David Bowie doc, Moon Age Daydream. I talk with the sound team and the film's director. It's an excellent conversation and I can't wait for everyone to hear it. Until then, my name is Tim Muirhead and on behalf of the Women Talking sound team, thanks for listening to Tonebenders. Talk to you soon. Tonebenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. 
You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? Tonebenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. 